In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning and welcome to our service. We're going to begin by singing hymn number 557, Praise to the Holiest in the Height. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank you. Do sit down. <clears throat> Welcome once again to our service this morning on the fifth Sunday of Lent. Well, Lent is uh, trotting past us at quite a speed. Uh, we're nearly at uh, Holy Week already. But this morning we're reflecting on the story of Jesus dining with, at the home of uh, Lazarus and Mary anointing his feet with that very expensive perfume. I'm thinking about what that tells us about God's abundance and generosity. 
As we begin our service this morning, we pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Let us pray. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son Jesus Christ delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. So we turn our thoughts now to God's word. Thank you, Alan. Our opening reading is taken from Isaiah, chapter 43, beginning to read at verse 16. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Thus he says, Do not remember the former things, or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing, now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people who I formed myself, so that they might declare my praise. And then turning to Philippians, uh, Paul's letter, chapter 3, beginning to read at verse 4b. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. 
as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes from the faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Jesus Christ has made me his own. Beloved, uh, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. 
So may God open our minds to understand his word to us today and open our hearts to respond to his promptings. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Do sit down. I wonder if you can recall an occasion when you felt acutely embarrassed. When I was thinking about this last night, the occasion that came to my mind was when I was about, oh, I don't know, 13, and I was singing in the, uh, the junior choir at school. And um, because I did a lot of sort of drama and sort of public speaking kind of things, the, le the music teacher said to me, would you announce the, uh, the next item? So I stood up, all sort of puffed up with pride, and very confidently announced that the junior choir were now going to sing four American soak songs. Of course, I meant folk songs. And it took me a little while to work out why everybody was laughing at me. But then, of course, the embarrassment started. I got increasingly hot and bothered and uh, kind of sweaty under the collar, and I wanted the ground to open up and swallow me. Does that sound familiar, that sensation of embarrassment? I reckon that we've all been there at one time or another. I'd be willing to put money on it that the only pre the person present at that dinner in the home of Mary, Martha and Lazarus, the only person present who didn't want to die of embarrassment when Mary did what she did, was Jesus. For the others, it would have been utterly toe curling. Picture the scene. We're in Bethany at the home of Lazarus, presumably recovered from his all too near death experience, and his sisters, Martha, Martha and Mary. Jesus has popped in on his way to Jerusalem for the Passover with his disciples. And hospitable as ever, they give a dinner for Jesus, Martha serving, Lazarus sitting at the table with him. No doubt the food was good and there was conversation around the table, perhaps a bit of banter, an opportunity for Jesus and the disciples to relax among friends, away from those who were even in that moment plotting Jesus' death. It's an ordinary domestic moment, no hint of the extraordinary thing that was about to happen. But then into this convivial scene comes Mary with a large jar of perfume, which she pours all over Jesus' feet. And then she wipes his feet with her hair as the fragrance of that expensive perfume permeates the entire house. It's so unexpected, so utterly inappropriate. For a woman to touch Jesus at all would have been taboo, but to touch his feet and wipe them with her hair was an act so intimate, so incredibly sensual, that everyone else in the room must have wished themselves a million miles away. So why on earth did she do it? She must have known that it would be provocative, but she didn't allow that to stop her. What was she thinking? What was she thinking? John gives us some clues, but we need to do some detective work to piece it together. I always say that context is always important, and it's worth noticing that of the three gospel accounts of this incident, only John identifies the house as being that of Lazarus and the woman as Mary. In the two other accounts, the woman goes unnamed. Mark and Matthew describe the woman pouring her perfume over Jesus' head. John alone has her pouring it over his feet, which ratchets up the awkward factor considerably. On the face of it, we see an act of abandonment that goes way beyond the bounds of what is appropriate. But this is no nameless woman who flits into the narrative and flits out again. This is Mary, who has a history with Jesus, a relationship, a context. This is Mary, who has already broached the cultural norms and sat at Jesus' feet, being a disciple, despite being a woman. 
Far from chastising her, Jesus accepted and even commended her for her desire to listen and to learn from him. This is Mary, who, along with her sister Martha, has experienced the desolation of her brother's death, followed by the unconfined joy of seeing him raised to life again at Jesus' hands. Small wonder, then, that Mary has a depth of feeling for Jesus that we might struggle to apprehend, never mind to articulate. And it's too great for her to contain. It overflows from her, a wave of gratitude and love and devotion, such that the only thing she can think of that comes anywhere near to expressing it is this act of extravagant generosity, the lavishing of expensive perfume over the feet of the man she loves so much. I don't think it's necessary for us to conjecture, as so many have, whether there was a romantic or even sexual component to her feelings for Jesus. What he has done for her and for her family, who he is, is grounds enough for the depth of her feeling towards him. Her expansiveness towards Jesus is, at least in part, a response to his enormous generosity in restoring to her family the thing that they valued most, their brother. It's always in the nature of God to be extravagant and generous. Everything that God does speaks of abundance, beginning with the generosity of creation. And those of us that have been following the Lent book have been thinking about the, the, the sheer variety of different species that God created. But then the invitation to Adam and Eve to share with him in curating that really vast and abundant creation. And then God promised Abraham offspring that would outnumber the stars. He promised the Hebrews a land flowing with milk and honey and provided more manna and quail in the wilderness than they could gather and eat. Jesus' life and teaching also embody God's extravagant generosity, from the extraordinary catch of fish to the 12 baskets left over after the 5,000 have eaten their fill. And God's ultimate generosity is seen in his self-giving in the person of Jesus. He doesn't hold himself back from us. He gives himself to us utterly and completely, even to death on the cross. God's grace is extravagant and abundant, and that's an amazing thing. But we're not always great in knowing how to respond to it, perhaps because extravagant generosity can make us feel uncomfortable. There's something about extravagance that's decidedly un-British. We sometimes describe people as being generous to a fault, but I'd want to challenge whether a quality like generosity can ever be a fault. Perhaps that says more about our reaction to someone else's behaviour, perhaps showing us to be less generous than we might like to think we are. God cannot be described as generous to a fault. There are no bounds to his love and his grace. It will never run out. But we don't always believe as though we believe that to be true. We have a tendency to huddle together in our churchy groups as if we're frightened to share God's love and grace with others in case there isn't enough left for us. It's a little bit like parents expecting their second child, worrying whether they'll have enough love to go around. And of course they find that love doesn't work like that. In God's generous economy, love is not diluted, it just grows. There's always enough and plenty left over. The people of Israel didn't always live as though they trusted God's generosity either, despite their experience of it. Instead of being the light to the Gentiles that God wanted them to be, instead they kept that light to themselves. Instead of living as a generous and hospitable people, they became exclusive and legalistic. So God had to find a new way to express his love and generosity, 
a way that would be even more extravagant and outrageous than before. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, he would fling open the doors to a whole new level of generosity in which relationship with God would finally be available to all who sought it. This is what Mary sees prefigured in Jesus' generosity to her and to her family. And it's what she responds to in her act of devotion. Judas wants to make Mary's act all about money, but Jesus won't let him. Generosity is about so much more than money. Yes, Mary demonstrates material generosity in her gift of perfume, but she also demonstrates spiritual generosity, a generosity of heart and life, giving her very self to Jesus in that moment. And we shouldn't be afraid of that. We shouldn't be embarrassed by it. She's grasped God's extravagant generosity for herself, and she can't fail but to respond with extravag equal extravagance. What would, like, what would life look like if we too allowed ourselves to grasp the breadth and length and height and depth of God's generosity and responded in kind, not stintingly or grudgingly, but extravagantly out of the depths of the riches that we ourselves have received. Generosity has many faces. Martha and Lazarus might not have been as demonstrative as their sister, but they offered generous hospitality, opening their house to Jesus and anyone with him. They provided him with food, but more importantly, they provided him with a safe space where he could be himself at a time when there was nowhere else safe for him. And the importance of that shouldn't be underestimated. If we can be generous enough to open our homes to people in this way, that can be a real gift to them. Hospitality, not just on our terms, but a safe haven whenever they need it. How else might we live out God's generosity to those around us? Perhaps by demonstrating the generosity of our welcome and acceptance of others, our willingness to include rather than exclude, by giving willingly of, and cheerfully of our time and of ourselves and, yes, of our money and our material resources. But the bedrock of our generosity must be our understanding and acceptance of the generosity of God himself. If we find that difficult to accept, perhaps because on some level we feel unworthy of God's generosity, maybe this would be a good time as we approach Holy Week to ask God to help us to understand more fully the grace he has lavished on us through the death and resurrection of Jesus, and to know that God counts each and every one of us worthy to receive it. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus promises, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. What could it look like for us to live out God's generous economy here in Wrighton or wherever we find ourselves? I wonder. Amen. Shall we stand together to declare our faith in God? The Father has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. 
He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. For it pleased God that in him all fullness should dwell, and through him all things be reconciled to himself. Give praise to the Father Almighty, to his Son, Jesus Christ the Lord, to the Spirit who dwells in our hearts, both now and forever. Amen. And in the light of the certainty of our faith and the generosity of God, let us come before him to confess our sins. Do please sit or kneel. As a father is tender towards his children, so is the Lord tender to those that fear him. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. He will not always be chiding, nor will he keep his anger forever. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. I have calmed and quieted my soul, like a child upon its mother's breast is my soul within me. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. So may Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so we continue in prayer as we turn to our prayers of intercession. Lord, we adore you, God of glory and Lord of love. We ask you to melt the clouds of sin and sadness and drive the doubt dark of doubt away. We thank you for the week we've just had, for the things we've done, for the things we could have done better, and for the things we ought not to have done. In faith we pray. Dear Lord, we continue our prayers for all those affected by the continuing unrest in and around the UK, uh, Ukraine border. We also pray for those in and around Afghanistan. We pray for all those who have been split up from their families and friends and for all those who fear for their own safety. In faith we pray Now, Lord, we pray for the charities that work with the homeless in and around the North East, especially the People's Kitchen and the Salvation Army. And we thank you for all their hard work and support they do. In faith we pray. We pray to you, our Lord. With the diocese, we pray for all prison chaplains. Naming before you the Reverend Kate Brook, the Reverend Andrew West, Reverend Rachel Thornham, Reverend Sarah Parkinson, and the Reverend Kate Jamie. Thank you also for the work they do with the inmates and their families. We also pray for the Church of Nigeria and the Most Reverend Henry C. Nabuka. In faith we pray. We pray to you, our God. Lord, we pray 
we now pray for all those who are sick in body, mind or spirit. We pray especially for those who are living with long-term conditions. We pray for Olive Murray, Una Milton, Melvin and Ryan James, Valerie Roger, David Polito, Jen Walker, Glynis Jones, Nathan James, Audrey Morn, Sean Toga, and Kevin Eldrenham. We also pray for members of our church who are not able to attend regularly. We pray for Mary Dixon, June Atkinson, Audrey Morn, Edna Dawson, Ewan Middleton, Pat Rutter, Mary Jobson, Carol Campbell Graham, and Phyllis Beatty. And Ron Snow. In faith we pray. We pray to you, our God. Lord, we pray for all those who have died recently and for all those known to us. Especially we think of at this time our dear friends, John Morn, Margaret Weir. And Mary Snow. We thank you for their friendship, love and support. We also pray for Doreen, for the family and friends of Doreen Minikin and Rachel during this time. And we ask that you grant us with them a share in your eternal kingdom. In faith we pray. We pray to you, our Lord. Today, Lord, we pray for the baptism that is to be held here pray for the parents and godparents and for all those taking part in the service to welcome Elodie Grace Ward into our Christian family. In faith we pray. We pray Lord, we pray your spirit may guide and strengthen us all in mission and service to you. And we rejoice in the fellowship of all your saints. We commend ourselves and all the prayers on the prayer tree to your unfailing love. God of mercy, you know us and love us and hear our prayer. Keep us in the eternal fellowship of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Thank you very much, Christopher. Would you like to stand for the peace? We are all one in Christ, heirs of the promise of the spirit of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Thank you. Do offer one another a sign of peace. Peace be with you. We sing together hymn number 598, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. Is that right? Have I got the right one? I've got the right one. That's okay. Good. of lights with angels and saints where heaven and earth unite may jesus meet us in the breaking of the bread amen the lord is here lift up your hearts let us give thanks to the lord our god It is indeed right and good to give you thanks and praise, Almighty God and Everlasting Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son. For in these 40 days you lead us into the desert of repentance, that through a pilgrimage of prayer and discipline we may grow in grace and learn to be your people once again. 
by the work of your spirit within us, you enable us to triumph over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. As we prepare to celebrate the Easter feast with joyful hearts and minds, we bless you for your mercy and join with saints and angels forever praising you and singing. and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his commandment, send your Holy Spirit that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again he praised you, gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. We remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people. Gather us in your loving arms and bring us with Saint Hilda and all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, O loving Father, forever and ever. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you have taught us that what we do for the least of our brothers and sisters, we do also for you. Give us the will to be the servant of others, as you were the servant of all, and gave up your life and died for us, but are alive and reign now and forever. Amen. We say together, Eternal God, comfort of the afflicted and healer of the broken, you have fed us at the table of life and hope. Teach us the ways of gentleness and peace, that all the world may acknowledge the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we come towards the end of our service this morning, I have some bands of marriage to publish. So I publish the bands of marriage of Paul Ridley and Marley Jane Taylor, both of this parish of Wrighton. This is for the first time of asking. If any of you know any reason why in law these persons may not marry each other, you are to declare it now. Good. I don't think Paul and Jane are with us this morning, but let's pray for them anyway. Gracious God, we thank you for Paul and Jane, for the love that they have found in one another. I pray that you would bless them in this time of preparation for their wedding day, that all would go smoothly, that you would calm any nerves and bring them to that day in joy, and that your blessing would be on them now and in all of their life together. In Jesus' name, amen. I can't think of any other notices. Linus, is there anything I need to mention? No, <gasps> no notices. How strange. Do stay for coffee if you can. I can smell the coffee, so it's obviously ready. And uh, shall we stand for our final blessing? May the God of generosity and abundance fill you with his love and his peace to overflowing. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Through Christ, in, the, in the name of Christ. Amen. Sorry, I forgot what I was doing there. I have forgotten something. Yes, I've just remembered. We have a birthday today. It's Dennis's birthday. Is it? Is it? Is that right? It's Dennis's birthday. Do you think we could sing happy birthday? Peter, can we have a blast of happy birthday, do you think? Shall we just start it? Yeah. Happy birthday to you. going to embarrass you by telling everybody how old you are but I hope you have a lovely day. <laughs> 82. 82. I'd never have guessed. I'd never have guessed. We're going to sing now our final hymn number 376 and can it be? <laughs>
us go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.